Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody's like in zombie state. The post-lunch coma. It is the post-lunch and beer, because that's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. So again, welcome those of you that haven't been in this room before to GERCON 2019. So I'm happy to pronu or pronounce. That'd be cool. <laughs> What am I going to be pronouncing? Present Dr. Kathy Ullman, and she's from the University of Buffalo. Is that right? Yep, so, University at Buffalo, technically. University at Buffalo. I was making the joke that here in Grand Rapids, we give them our lake effect snow. We do as much as we can with it and then give it over to her. So, And, and we take it and send it on. To wherever. Wherever. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So um, I have given this presentation a couple times. I love interaction, so don't feel like you have to wait till the end to like jump in. Um, I do realize it is after lunch, so I will do my best to, you know, I don't know, do a monkey impression or something so that you stay awake. Um, like I said, feel free to jump in with questions, and here we go. So uh, this is kind of our basic agenda. I'll talk a little bit about me, very little, because you all don't want to hear too much about me. Um, and then we're going to talk about this idea of, of fear, fear and loathing, cost of fear, uh, the history, some consequences of fear, you know, where, wh how we're going to move forward to move away from the fear after we change the paradigm, and some final thoughts. So this is a little bit about me, me, but not really. This is Minnie. Minnie is a sloth who uh, I absolutely adored. She lived to be about 32 years old. She was a resident of the Buffalo Zoo. And uh, I used to go visit her frequently. And unfortunately, old age does happen. And she wound up with a heart condition. And she's no longer with us. Um, but I put this up just because you know I'm kind of sloth-like. I like to kind of hang around and sleep. Um, but I don't get to do a whole lot of that here, because I'm too busy having fun with all you guys. So this is really more about me. Um, I've been at the university almost 20 years. I'm involved in lots of stuff. I speak at lots of cons. Um, I have a few certifications and degrees and things. And if you really want more info about me, hit me up later, and I'm happy to tell you. All right, so let's start with fear and loathing. And the first time I gave this talk, by the way, uh, was in Vegas, so it was particularly appropriate. Um, <laughs> so take a look at this. Sort of interesting, right? Look at the date, 1989. This was not yesterday, right? This was a while ago. Sort of the, quote, early days. Look at this one from 2007. See anything really similar? What's similar here? Same approach, right? And what's being used here? Fear, right? This, this, this fear tactic, this language that we see, find out what's lurking, your system can be infected. It's the same language. We have been using fear for a bazillion years. It has been around forever. And we still use it. And unfortunately, to some degree, it's still working, right? We're still selling stuff using fear. And this is not ideal. So this is what we think fear can do. We think it has the capacity to motivate and change behavior in a positive way. But we're going to see that's not really what fear is good at. It, it, it has the potential potential to do some behavior changing. But it's usually short term. It's very, very difficult to manage. And it, in terms of managing expectations, you're going to have a really hard time with it. So let's, we'll, let's take a step back and look at the cost of that fear. So we spend a lot of money because there's a lot of fear, right? We're so afraid that the bad guys are going to break in and get us that ultimately we spend money. And in 2017, we were at 86.4 billion. Uh, by 2018, we're at 114 billion, and that number has gone up substantially. Um, the total for this year, uh, I, I, I don't even know the exact number, but I can tell you, it just keeps increasing. And it, it, this is all what we're spending on, right, to make things safe or secure, which I think is sort of a mistake to even think about it in that way. Because is security, like, is being secure an end goal? Is that like anything we can ever actually achieve, like being secure? Is that really a thing? I, I don't think so. And uh, for those of you who find that particular question interesting, I would invite you to make sure you see uh, Jeff Mann's talk later today, because he does sort of touch on this, and I have an idea for a talk that's going to go further than that. But uh, so the point is, 
We're spending more money with this idea we're going to somehow magically be more secure. Um, but guess what? Yeah, it, it's not working. Um, instead, uh, we see this particular thing. Now, this is Gurkhan. How many of you have ever heard Chris Roberts speak? Yay, people who know who Chris is. Awesome. And of course, if you don't know who Chris is, please stick around for the next talk, because that will be Chris. So one of his hot topics for a long time has been this whole idea of a blinky box syndrome. The thing with blinky box syndrome is that people continue to buy blinky boxes, the, late, the, the next iteration of whatever the blinky box is, right? So whether it's next gen or machine language or AI, like that's always the latest and greatest terminology being used. But at the end of the day, actual blinky box that's supposed to keep you safe, right? Be this easy button. And he rails against that. He says, you know, look, stop trying to find the one thing that's going to fix all of our problems, because at the end of the day, it's not going to. So the re where this talking part came from, and the reason I mentioned this, is I thought, gee, easy button. OK, so blinky box syndrome. How did we get here? How do we get to a point where we're constantly buying the magic box that we think is going to fix everything? Why, why would we even want to do that? are we so afraid? Where did all of this come from? And so I started looking at fear. And as we saw, what fear does not do is it does not motivate people for long-term change. Right? This is really what it does. It, it causes people to be defensive. If there's not enough fear being used, you, can, you get complacency. People just don't give a shit. They just do not care. Uh, if, if you have too much fear, there can be paralysis where people just don't know what to do. And I find that a lot of folks who are not in our industry sit in this, in one of these two places, right? They're either like, eh, I don't care, or eh, I don't care because there's nothing I can do. I'm screwed any way you look at it, right? And, and that's not too surprising given the fact that all the messaging they're getting is fear based stuff. Um, you have some sort of overreactive response. It's just not good. So where did all of this come from? Well, let's look. Now, this propaganda has nothing to do with computing, but has everything to do with fear. And we have seen this time and time again, right? So this Japanese camp, and of course, Russia. Can't, can't be nice to, to Russia, because everything can go wrong. Um, so we've used fear outside of the IT industry forever. So it's not just here. It's been used since the beginning of time. And so obviously, to some degree, it does work. But, but what, like I said, what it does not do particularly well is it does not change behavior for long term. So who remembers the orange book? Is there anybody here who remembers a couple people? Yep. Yeah. So let's go back in time a little bit. I'm gonna, we're going to do a, a, a little mini history lesson. Some of you may already know all this stuff. And uh, for those of you, I apologize. But it really is a mini history lesson. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but this is sort of the beginnings of uh, computing and security as we know it. But most people probably don't realize this is where it starts. So there's no information security. There's no cyber security. There's just security. And when computing first starts doing anything that's security related, this is really all we see. We see its policy, its controls. It's really very basic. And nobody's really afraid of anything because, except making sure that the, the same things are done in the way that the government always makes sure the same things are done, right? Then we have kind of the beginnings of the internet, and this is going to jump through a huge hoop of time. But um, we know we have the very beginnings with ARPANET, which are your four computers that are at major universities that all want to be able to do research, and they all get connected so that effectively they can be backups for each other. And that's really sort of why this all starts. And I give this example, I actually give a piece of this mini lesson to folks in a support role all the time when I'm trying to explain to them why security is like, a problem. I try to explain to them that at the early days, there was no real security of the internet because you see the internet was born of this idea that a bunch of researchers were sharing information. Why do we need security? It's a bunch of people who just want to make sure their stuff doesn't go down, which opens a lot of eyes. Most people don't realize that. So not too long after that, we have something called BitNet. I bring up BitNet uh, for those of you who are not aware. Um, the, the town where I grew up, um, was part of the SUNY uh, system, 
uh, SUNY Fredonia, and that is where one of the places where BitNet was. So uh, BitNet was most of the SUNY schools, State University of New York. Uh, it also included Yale and a couple of other schools. But the, I bring this up because these are some of my early memories of the internet, logging in and telnetting, yes, telnetting, uh, to other places and communicating with people in other schools. Not too long after that, we wind up with this personal computer boom and companies start to use the internet. And this is where we start to see some fear. So the very first virus, and this is where we see the beginning of the fear, we see brain. Brain comes out of nowhere in theory, and it affects a whole bunch of machines. Now, what's interesting about brain is that the purpose for brain was to be this sort of copyright infringement tool, yet its manufacturers or, or makers, if you will, started getting all these phone calls that their machines were get, being wiped by this thing, and that was not ideal. People were very upset about that. So McAfee who wasn't who he is now, who was just sort of starting to tinker with all of this stuff, thinks, hmm, I wonder if I can reverse engineer this to fix it for people. And he does that. And he puts it on a bulletin board. And he makes it available freely for everybody. That's right, for free. But this intrigues him, and this is kind of the beginning. So within about a year, he starts his own company, which, of course, most of you are familiar with. By the late 80s, Semantic and Sophos debut. And what I find most interesting is by 89, we have more anti antivirus vendors than there are viruses. People are afraid. And the reason that we have all of these vendors is clearly they can be supported. People are buying their stuff. They're afraid. So the government, the government's afraid. Their response I find particularly interesting because, I mean, again, look at these fear words. Potentially devastating weapon. Now, these quotes come from an article that was in a Toronto newspaper. A Toronto uh, reporter was asking these government, these U.S. government officials, you know, are you worried about viruses? What do you think the problems are? And these are the kinds of things they were saying. So clearly, they were fearful. You know, honestly, they had a right to be afraid because uh, then the Morris worm hits and a chunk of the internet kind of goes away, which one-tenth doesn't seem like a lot, but back then there weren't that many computers on the internet. So a tenth was actually fairly substantial. Right to be worried. Viruses were absolutely a problem. So what did the government do in response? Well, for cert. Now think about this for just a second, and I'm not going to delve into this. The very first cert was at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon Institution. And I think we're okay. All right, bear with me here. So Carnegie Mellon has the first cert established there. This is their response. Now, at that point, we have these people buying all this antivirus, right? In by ninety nineteen ninety. The, this is the annual cost of malware removal, $1.5 That's a lot of money if you consider the fact that computers weren't the way they are now, where they're everywhere. And so companies looked at that and said, you know, I can pay a few bucks a machine, or I can hire somebody to deal with this for a fairly small amount of money instead of having to worry about it kind of wholesale, right? So if I spend a couple salaries or I'm spending five to 10 bucks on a machine, this isn't a lot of money. I'm afraid enough, I'm gonna do it. So now we start to get worried about the outside, right? These books come to light because people are starting to think about security in a different way we start to think about internet security because that's a thing that's coming to be. So in 91, we have this practical Unix book, and then in 94, firewalls and the internet security. And what happens in 1993? Anybody know? What's the big thing that kind of happens between these two? The what? Well, sort of, but... The World Wide Web becomes a thing. Mosaic comes into being. 
Yeah, and now it's everywhere. So coupled with the personal computer boom, now everybody's getting on the internet. But you know, it's all a matter of protection, right? You can trust us. We're McAfee. Yes. So when I was talking about blinky boxes, was I talking about this kind of blinky box, you think? Yeah, probably not. So these were the beginnings of the blinky boxes. Now we're really worried about us versus them, the outsiders, right? So the folks that could get in. And we have the very beginning, uh, this deck seal. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an image of that, um, but I do have images. This is Checkpoint, and this is Cisco, sort of the, the default standards uh, these days when we think of early firewalls. Um, but the, the deck seal was the first one, first commercial thing. And, you know, it was a door. It was open or it was closed. It was very basic. And that was its purpose, was to keep the outsiders out and the, and the insiders from being attacked from something on the outside. Pretty basic. Uh, and then, you know, basically everybody thought it's virtually fail-safe protection. We've got this firewall. Nobody can get in. And then Mitnick decided, eh, I'm going to hack the Souping Computing Center in San Diego. No big deal. And, of course, they had one of these things in place. And then he used this, um, he used some spoofing and uh, some sequence prediction attacks, and he got in. So first we had the virus software, and people, viruses were still happening. And then we had the magic blinky box, and then somebody got through it. So uh, today, now that we have like all the things, right, we have our AI and our ML and our next gen, and all of our magic boxes and all the money in the world to spend on it, now what? Are things any better? Yeah, no. <laughs> we're still seeing the same problem, right? So what we're seeing here uh, is the fact that even though the actual number of breaches is down, the number of records is significantly up. Uh, I mean, you know, 126%, that, that's not good. So uh, what's the state of the things today? Yeah, that. <laughs> not good. Very not good. So beyond that, what are some consequences of the fear that you know has basically gripped this industry? So let's look at this. So we'll talk briefly about FUD. How many of you have heard the term FUD? Yeah, most of you. So this whole idea of fear, uncertainty, of, and doubt, pro I would be willing to bet most of you have heard of in terms of just general marketing and, and lies that companies are, are trying to, to tell you, right? But I want to tell you about the origins of FUD, because the origin of FUD in the technical industry starts with IBM. And they start with this guy, Gene Omdahl, who leaves IBM because he's going to start his own company and he's going to build his own computers. Now, what he does is he builds a computer that does not require a fan because of it puts the processing stuff on the outside of the machine. So what does IBM do? They come out with all this advertising that says, aha, do not buy his thing because there is no fan, and that will be bad, and your machine will burn up. Except, wait a minute, it didn't need a fan. So it's not just that lies or mis thing, misleading information is being told. It's actually providing misinformation. It's going out of the way. So the FUD we're seeing today isn't even necessarily of that nature. But I want you to understand, this is kind of where it starts. And I really like this quote from Rich Smith, and I'm not a, a duo advocate per se, but I like this idea that, you know, our, our industry is generating FUD in order to sell hope, because that's really what we're doing. And of course, this still persists. So I found this on the interwebs. You'll notice, if you look carefully, for internal use only, not for distribution. And if you read through this, it's EMC that they're slamming, and it's the same kind of technique. They're talking about what EMC can't do. But in reality, I'd be willing to bet if we did some research, we'd determine that they're just going, they're, they're talking past the product. So they're still doing this today. We also have this fear-driven image problem because, you know, ultimately the media has caused a lot of people to think about 
us as a hacking community and what we look like and who we are in a certain way. And I like this quote, again, I, you know, I'm not a, a huge duo advocate or anything, although I, we, we do use their product now. Um, I like this particular quote because it explains this idea that the media has sort of created this mythos that we're now saddled with. Uh, might look something like this. No one's ever seen this before, right? And every hacker you know wears gloves, wears a hoodie, like this is what we do, right? So I do try to explain to people that the media has unfortunately created that bias, that, you know, really it's this idea that we understand how, how a computer works instead of necessarily how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> and I had a very interesting conversation that, uh, that added something to do with intent here uh, last night having to do with this idea that uh, not only do we understand how things work and not necessarily just how they're supposed to work, but we actually use that knowledge for some purpose. And, you know, usually if, if you're doing the things for the right reasons, then you're using that information to help another company or, or help somebody in some capacity. There's also fear in the development world. My husband, who's sitting over there, he's a developer, and we had a long conversation about, you know, is this just in our universe? And he said, no, we're under the gun, we're given very short deadlines, they don't teach us any of this stuff about security in school, even when you try to learn this stuff sort of outside of school, there isn't a whole lot of stuff in any good place to, to learn it. Um, so it, it, this is a real challenge. There's a lot of additional effort that's required in time for code review at the end because it's not baked in from the beginning. So where does this leave us? Well, normally consistency we see is a good thing, right? We normally think if we do things the same way and we do them the right way that we're going to have consistent positive results. But in our case, what we're seeing are people doing things the wrong way and have consistently poor results. We're working against and despite our users, we're buying blinky boxes, we're not training anybody who's doing any programming. I mean, you can kind of see where this is going, right? So this is our result. Not too surprising. And I'm sure never, and nobody's ever seen this definition, ever? Definition of insanity? Yeah, so, but it's worse than that. Because as much as we are frustrated as an industry because we see things happening over and over and over again, it's not just us that are frustrated. And it's not just us having this problem. Fear ultimately is going to turn to anger. And anger is going to turn to hate. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. This is an actual study. Everyone hates cybersecurity professionals. And it's true. Because people fear what they do not understand, and they get angry because they do not understand, they start to have hatred toward us. And that's our fault. Because we don't fix that. These are some of the perceptions these folks have. They think we're doom mongers or we're policemen, right? We are horrifically understood as a community, except within our own community. And, you know, obviously we could go on a, a tangent about even issues within our own community. But as a general rule, outside of our community, people don't know what we do. If you tell them I'm a hacker, I work in the security, you know, computer security, I get people all the time, what do you do? What exactly do you do all day? They have no idea. And unless you tell people within your organization why they should care about who you are and what you do, they're not going to know. So here's some more. Um, people have bad experiences when new rules are implemented. Um, you know, they think that our purpose is to keep the lights on, and all we are is some sort of reactive cost center. Again, these, you know, real study, people actually think these things. So it's not too surprising that this definition becomes a thing. Is that true at all? Not even remotely? That's actually, I think, perfect. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, okay, fair, fair. I don't drink at all. So, you know, I mean, you know, aside from some uh, water. 
Um, but the, the point is that we're not in a good place. And so I'd propose we need to change that paradigm. Now, who has seen this image before? OK, quite a few of you. So um, what is this image of? It's a duck bunny, right? And how do you see the duck versus how do you see the bunny? Squint. The point is it's a very sudden shift in perception, right? If you look at it one way, you see the duck. And if you slightly look at it the other way, you see the bunny. It's very subtle. So what I'm going to propose here is let's not stand on our heads and try to be like radically different because we don't need to be radically different. We need these subtle changes. So this, that's where I'm going to go with this. So how are we going to overcome fear? Well, we're going to be honest, and yet we're going to be very discerning about what we tell people. So when you're having an issue or an incident, you don't want to keep all that information to yourself, but there are lots of details you don't necessarily need to tell everybody, right? So you, but you don't want to say nothing's happening if something is happening. So you have to figure ways to straddle that line. You need to provide pow empowering messages. Uh, you know, Jason spoke about that earlier for those of you who are at his talk. And, and you want to be an advocate and find others who will advocate for you. You know, actively encourage those best practices. And when you find people who are doing that as well, you want to, you know, figuratively anyway, grab hold of them and say, yay, we like the way you think. Because ultimately, we like to give negative messaging. How many of you have phishing campaigns in your office, like self-phishing campaigns? Right? OK. If you provide a report, what is in the report that you're giving to management? How many people failed? OK. What does that reinforce? Negativity. Why are you not saying 25% of our people did really well here? Let's go for 30, or 40, or go, pie in the sky, go for you know 90. But the point is, the messaging we're providing is our own fault. And even when we're talking to management and they're asking questions, we're not telling them, hey, why don't we think about it this other way? Let's focus on this positive message that we can try to get people to do more of. Because people are, will gravitate toward positive messages way better than they will gravitate toward the negative ones. We need to get rid of us versus them, right? We saw some of where this us versus them came from um, because we had the outside and the inside. And of course, we still have that today in traditional culture. But what we don't need is us versus them inside. And there's a lot of that. We as a community really like to be condescending. I get it. It's easy because we see people and we think, Ugh, oh my goodness. Yet again, this person clicked on something. But the reality is we have to teach them. And there are times when there are people we are not going to be able to change their behavior. But we have to think about how we're trying to change their behavior. And straight up fear is not effective at long-term change. And so we have to be patient, which can be very painful. Um, if you promise to follow through on looking into something, please do and get back to them. I know I hate it when somebody leaves me hanging and I want to understand something. And everybody in your organization feels exactly the same way. I guarantee it. Um, you know, and if you can do these kinds of illuminating things, you can help build this community of trust. Make sure when you're communicating with them, it's on a level that people both understand and can relate to. They're not in the security business. They're not usually technical people. The example that I love to give here, I worked for an organization where we had actual rocket scientists. These people were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Guess what they sucked at? <laughs> using their computers, right? But guess what? The company didn't pay them to be good at using a computer. They paid them for being rocket scientists. So. You know, being pissed off that these folks don't get it is not really fair to them because it's our job to tell them what they need to know to do their jobs on that side of the world. And whether it's in a support role or security role, that's really all about us teaching them. We don't want to do this. 
This is a very, very bad habit that we like to get into. We want to replace fear with a healthy skepticism because, of course, we want people to have a certain level of fear in the sense that we want them to see things like phishing messages and not just either not care or be so terrified they don't know what to do. So I always respond when somebody sends us stuff that says, you know, uh, is this phishing or is this bad? I will say, thank you for being skeptical and suspicious. It thanks them immediately for having reported it to us, and it lets them know I care that they've sent it to me and they've done the right thing. Again, I'm reinforcing that positive behavior. So in general, you know, we want people to, when they're engaging with new ideas, we want them to question stuff. We want to play devil's advocate. This is this whole idea behind healthy skepticism. And I use this particular image um, because in the story that this particular quote comes from, Arthur Conan Doyle is talking about the difference between observing and seeing. I'm sure many of you coming in here came up some stairs somewhere because there's stairs everywhere here, right? How many of you have been up and down the stairs just between the vendor hall and here? At least like a bunch of times since you got here. A few times, right? You saw those stairs. What if I asked you how many stairs, how many steps there were? Could you tell me? Yeah, I have no clue. The point is, you saw them, but you didn't really observe them. And observe them is taking note of these extra fine little details. And so this, in the story that he, he is giving, it's, he gives an example like this, having to do with steps, and just this difference between seeing and observing. And we see things all the time, but we don't take the time to observe. And this whole idea of critical thinking and, and healthy skepticism involves this idea of observation. So outside of InfoSec, because we need to stop siloing, right? It's not us versus them, it's all of us. We all need the win because the good guys at the end of the day really should be winning. We need to teach them to question stuff on websites, the legitimacy of an email, you know, daily online risks in general. And then, you know, outside, I'm sorry, inside InfoSec, we need to be skeptical of the materials that are using FUD and fear to try to sell us stuff. Don't support the, the piece of the industry that's still using this. I won't talk to vendors if I don't have to, well, in general, but, <laughs> but specifically, I will go out of my way if I have a vendor that's trying to sell me something using a fear-based approach. And I'll tell them straight up, you talk to me like this, you tell me how I should be afraid, I have no interest in listening to you. Because, you know, very much like a politician's ad where they're telling me why I shouldn't vote for the other guy, you haven't told me why to vote for you. It's the same idea, right? So speak out against that image. You know, I guarantee you we're not going to completely change the universe in terms of, you know, folks seeing that meant that image of the hacker and the term hacker as bad, right? There's no way we're going to be able to completely change that. But we can educate people and we can teach the folks that we can teach. There are going to be times where we can get that message across and we can change that perception. And even, even if it's only in our own little circle, that makes a huge difference. Because if we can change our own little circle, then hopefully each one of the people in our little circle can start to send that message out. We want to see nuanced learning replacing fear. So again, this is this very uh, subtle shift. And so instead of being afraid and saying, we catch users, we want to partner with them. When I started in the security office almost 10 years ago, one of the first things that I did was start using language like, we are partnering with you in online safety. Because guess what? At the time, there were three of us and 35,000 people in our university. No way we can keep everybody safe. But we can partner with you, we can work with you to be safe, and we can answer your questions. That's what we're there for. You know, again, the us versus them, and then, you know, this idea that we focus on who did the right thing instead of who did the wrong thing. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because, well, obvious, right? We need to get back to the basics. We need to get away from the blinky boxes. We need to know where our data is, where our devices are, um, remove the easy ways in. I mean, everybody in this room, I'm, you're probably sick of hearing this stuff, but it still, of course, applies. However, do not let 
the goal of perfection become the enemy of good. And we do this a lot. Well, I can't do it all the way, so I'm not going to do it at all. No. Even if you do it a little, it's still better than not doing anything. So, you know, you can only get one department on board with something. Awesome. You've gotten one department on board. And you know what? When that particular division finds you're not like these scary, horrible people that they think you are, you might actually get buy-in from other divisions. It's crazy that way. With an education, we need to see these changes. For any of you who have any kind of insight or, uh, you know, light into other places that uh, teach folks, whether it's formally in formal education or you're in, you know, maybe uh, 2600s or other meeting groups, we need to start integrating security into everything. So, you know, get involved within other organizations in your community and show them that you can be secure or more secure in through these methods and, you know, start from the beginning. They should be able to ultimately, a developer should be able to self-evaluate and look for problems and communicate security issues to their higher ups. Um, you know, my husband actually has become an advocate within his organization because he's spent so much time with me now. He sees what the, the problems are and he's gotten involved and he's used, to, he's used some tools that he's, uh, learned about through some of these conferences and taken it back to his job and said, Hey gang, we've got some problems here. And so it's gotten that whole organization to think more about this sort of thing. It also means that, you know, if your, if your dev folks understand what they're up against, they also know that they don't know everything and none of us know everything. But you have to know where your area of expertise stops and someone else's might start. So it's important to understand that so you know when to ask for help. All right. So how do we move forward with all of that? Because I did promise you something about moving forward. Affecting change is hard. How many of you have heard, oh my God, we're so hopelessly broken, we can't possibly fix anything, the, you know, infosec industry is a shit show, Twitter's a firestorm, oh my God, it's the end of the world. Anybody heard that? A few people, maybe? No, never. Today, right, yeah. We haven't had any eureka moments. We're not magically getting better, right? Why is that? Well, guess what? <laughs> we're old. Even those of you who aren't that old. This industry is old, and those of us who've been doing it for a while, we've been around a long time, and change for people who've been around for a while is not the easiest thing in the world. Anybody who's tried to say, oh, I don't know, lose a few pounds, eat healthier, you know, exer I'm going to exercise, I'm going to make a you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to exercise three days a week, and then like a week into it, you're like, yeah, that was good, right? We, we suck at this. It's not easy. And so making wide sweeping changes even through our own uh, groups is going to be hard but I'll tell you what oh let me let me touch on this really really quickly first um, so this is a from a book called switch which has to do with making change from the bottom up instead of from the top down and I work in an organization where I guarantee you the folks at the top are not about to make significant change in how they think. But that doesn't mean change can't happen. And so what the, these quotes basically are trying to point out the fact that if you can find some change that works, ultimately, you will see change start to work. But it will be slow, which doesn't mean it'll be easy, but it means it can snowball and it can happen. So some food for thought. So, like I said, you know, we, we've been doing this a while. We're tough to, to change our behaviors, but we should still be able to like shift that paradigm slightly, right? Those were not huge changes for us. And that's why I proposed them. Where I think we can make the biggest difference is in participation. And by participation, I mean outside of our silos, move away from IT. And ultimately, we need to partner with the next generation. The folks that are doing hacks for kids, that's amazing because those are the folks we need to get to, right? They're malleable. They're not less, quite set in their ways yet. They, most of them are already computer literate. They're already playing with gizmos. They always already love tinkering. That's why we can have hacks for kids because these kids come in and they're curious. They're curious in a way I think a lot of us are, but don't have the time to always explore the things we're interested in. They're eager, eager to teach. And, or they're eager to learn from those of us who are teaching. 
So absolutely reach out to all of these younger generations wherever you can. We need all of these partnerships everywhere you can find them. And I'll tell you a, a really interesting story about a way that I was able to affect a very tiny partnership. One of the folks that uh, I used to do end user support for, because that's sort of where I started, um, she and I are friends on Facebook. Yes, I, I'm on the Facebooks. And she posted something about being very frustrated that she'd gotten an email that had an attachment, and the attachment had a password protected file, which, by the way, was a legitimate password protected file. This wasn't, you know, some, some garbage. She works with, um, some students and those particular students get grant funds through, uh, higher ed grant funds through the, through the feds. And so there's this reporting that she has to do. And she had complained on Facebook bitterly about the fact that she had to open this attachment. And she had to put in this password after she'd already logged in her email. And that was redundant. Why did she have to do this twice, right? I could have taken the attitude a lot of us do and go, oh my God, what the hell's wrong with her? It's clearly not redundant. There's an obvious reason for this, right? And we probably all know what it is. She had no idea. So I took the opportunity to educate her and anyone else who happened to be watching that feed and nobody else in that feed, I guarantee you, had any real technical background. And I explained, when you log into your email, that password is what protects your mailbox. But when mail is transmitted, it can be seen, right? And that's not protected. And she went, oh, yeah, we understand it's a hassle, but now she understands why it's necessary. She's less frustrated. She's less angry. And it took so little. And I created a partnership there. And so now she's willing to ask me things. We find these opportunities in the strangest places, but they're so worthwhile. So how do we hand over this baton? Well, we find ways to work with these kids. So B-Sides is a great example of our B-Sides, B-Sides Rochester. Yes, I know I'm from Buffalo, but I actually run B-Sides Rochester. And um, B-Sides Rochester partners with Rochester Institute of Technology. So we have college kids that come in through there. Things like Coder Dojo, Cyber Camps. Um, I'm involved in the Gen Cyber Camp that we run, Odyssey the Mind. Obviously, I mentioned Hacks for Kids. You know, any kind of mentoring opportunities, anything that you can do to get involved is huge because that generation does not need to make the mistakes we've made. And we can complain about our mistakes all day long, but if we really want to see change, we need to teach that next generation how to not make those mistakes. So some final thoughts. Whatever you do, make yourself and your office, whenever possible, a judgment-free zone. Yeah, those folks don't know what you know. Guess what? Not their job to know and that's okay, right? Educate, don't adjudicate, just teach them. Learn what they know. You'd be amazed what you can learn from other people. I mean, I learned a bunch about rocket science that I knew nothing about after working with them. They learned from me, I learned from them. It was a really, really neat experience. And with that, any questions? Yes. Where have you seen some of the opportunities to inject this kind of change? Okay, so the question has to do with where do I see opportunities to inject the kind of change? Um, in all kinds of weird places, like that, that Facebook interaction, um, getting, getting involved with these kids in those different groups. Um, if you do some research and you find out that, you know, there's a, a Coder Dojo or a, a Hacks for Kids, or anything like that, Reach out to them. Libraries are a fantastic place. You can reach out. Libraries have stuff for kids all the time. And I'd be very surprised if a public library didn't say, ooh, we'd love to have you come and do stuff with the kids. Um, you know, school systems, there's all different kinds of opportunities. And don't look outside, don't fail to look outside the box for them because they can come in the weirdest places um, to educate. Any other questions? Yes. So the question has to do with whether or not I see anything that's already being done in terms of, of teaching 
this idea of, of the lack of fear going forward with these folks. Is that, is that sum it up? Okay. Uh, and no, I don't see that. I mean, I certainly see it in my own experiences because I try to be an advocate for that. Um, but I think we need more of that. Um, I see it in, in some things. Um, I see it in some of the groups at, uh, at DEF CON, the, the, the kids, um, I can't remember what that's called, but there's, there's the kids event that goes on there. Roots, yes. I see that in Roots. You know, they teach those kids not to be afraid of what they're doing and just to dig in and learn stuff. Um, but I don't know that, that that overall message is getting out there. I think that's part of what we need to start doing, which is why I wanted, you know, to be somebody who said, hey, we should do this. So does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. So, so the question has to do with what do I, what do I see in terms of how to address the, the easy button, if you will, with your CISO or an individual consumer, um, to get away from that easy button? Um, I think that it's really just taking a step back and explaining to them the bigger picture. They're going to have seen all the fear messages. They're not going to know where it's come from. I think with the CISO example, it's important that you understand the, the business that they're in. I think we spend so much time being insular in IT in our own universe that we often lose sight of what the goal of whatever the company is, right? So our CISO may or may not be aware of the connection between the business goals and security goals, even though that's really supposed to be their job. They may have come up through the ranks and maybe they never had that education. And so I think sometimes we have to educate ourselves better on what our organization does where our security message fits into that and how we, how buying this blinky, this next thing doesn't solve these 27 other problems. Um, I mean, I can tell you, like, we, we re recently purchased a piece of hardware, but it was to, it was for one very specific purpose and we made it very clear this is, this is not going to fix these other things. It's going to fix this one issue. Uh, and it's not, the be all end all solution, but we think that it will provide value into how we're securing our environment. So for example, we recently added duo to our environment. Two factor is huge, right? It's, but it's not the be all end all. Can I, can a bad guy get around two factor? Is that a thing? Yeah, of course it is. And if your CISO is paying attention, they'll probably read articles that say that. But then you just point out things like, well, that's great, but the overhead of trying to get around that versus the overhead of I'm just going to send you out phishing messages, that's a substantial difference. And that's up to us to do the educating. Does that help? Any other questions? Yes. I think you take that information. So you can't fix these companies, right? Um, you can do your best to avoid the ones that use the negative speak sort of overall. Um, but if you're faced with having to look at these companies and maybe going with one that does use negative speak, I would take the information you have about that product and sit down with the powers that be and explain to them the reality of it. Say, I know you've read all this stuff, but let me tell you what's really the truth here. This is really for our environment. These are the threats we're seeing. Okay. And they're very real threats, but we need to not just react. We need to think this through and then you can show them. And here are, you know, some articles that talk about how this kind of technology can assist with this kind of threat. And it's all about that mitigation. So it's really putting it in context, I think, for the people in your organization. And they aren't going to know that they're going to know their piece of it. This is where you trade information. So you find out from them what's important, what do they, what do they want to understand, and you help them get there. I think that's the best way to handle it. Any other questions? Yes. In, so the question has to do with whether there are other industries. Oh, from a fear-based approach to, to not. And I honestly don't know that there are a ton of other industries 
that do as heavily marketing fear stuff as we do. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are some. What? Insurance. Insurance. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Excellent example. Um, and and I honestly don't know. I don't spend any time in that space. Um, but I have to think that over time. Uh, their return on investment is going to be limited in terms of, of the fear too, right? Because if I sell you insurance based on all kinds of fear and then nothing happens, mm, now we get into a cry wolf situation, which is something in my own environment um, that I feel very strongly about. You know, is this even an incident? Let's not call something an incident until it's truly an incident. Otherwise, you get this sort of crazy idea that everything we do is an incident, and then nobody cares about it anymore. So it's that sort of overarching, we use fear so much that we stop caring. Any other questions? Yes. What, what, say that again? Oh, home security systems. I still see some marketing with bad guys breaking into the house with the gloves and the hats and the ski masks. But it, it, there may be some, some newer marketing that's not like that. But certainly I still see a fair amount of that. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I would encourage you to... Be that change you want to see in the world. Thank you.